When customers complain about your price, what I usually say is, I say, well, look, after tax, we make about 10, 10 cents on the dollar. So how much do you want to discount? Generative search is coming, which is basically just Google's answer to chat GPT. You know, when people say, well, I'm trending, I'm working on my margin, blah, 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 I think that's bullshit. <laughs> Hey, how's it going? It's Tim Brown. This is the HVAC Hustle Podcast. Today I've got Ken Goodrich from Gettle. How you doing? Good. Good. You? I'm doing very well. We're talking about cash flow systems and best time to sell. I think there's a lot of people that are getting offers for their business, sometimes three a day. And so we're just going to talk about the, the things leading up to that. What do you want to make sure is in place before you do that and how to spot a good offer basically. Okay, I've been around that stuff for a while. Okay, perfect. But first, I've got a question for you, which is, have you considered potentially bringing back the mullet? The uh, mullet. Because I know in your book, uh, E-Myth for HVAC Contractors that you mentioned, you felt like a rock star with a mullet. And I feel like they are really coming, there's a lot of people they wearing They are coming mullets. back. Yeah, so have you thought back. about just I, I li really, really have considered doing the you know the whole gray hair long hair, gray hair stuff. Yeah. Maybe do a little mullet ish. Yeah. Um, but I you know it doesn't grow as fast anymore. <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> okay. Okay. But if I could, I would. <laughs> All right, I dig it. Um, second question is we have a little series called Hot Take and Cold Trend. So the hot take part is. What's a hot take that you have on the HVAC industry uh, that some people might find controversial, but you really believe? I believe that um, I believe that uh, connected home is very important these days, and uh, devices like Smart AC, for instance, where you can quickly put on a very simple monitor device that has a very robust data set and can predict failures for your customers and you've tied yourself to them through the through the app with your brand on, the na on their name and they can be looking at you you know an infinitely more times of, over the course mm. of the year and seeing you're involved with their and their uh, systems and making sure that they're uh, working correctly and you know looking out for their best interest and you show up when they need you not mm. uh, not the the norm where it's been, you know, we're going every six months, for instance, on your maintenance calls. So I really believe the industry and the demands of the industry and our labor shortages and such are going to require new technology to take some of that burden off the business. And Smart AC is one of those things. Mm. Is there like a, a company that does that with like the branded app that you recommend? Well, Smart AC does that. Oh, that's called Smart AC. Right. Okay. Yeah, SmartAC.com. Uh, and they will, they will. You put the monitoring device in the house. You got a supply air uh, probe. You got a, a sensor. You got a return air sensor. Check your filters and such, and your airflow, as well as a wet sensor. Mm. And you can add wet sensors for by the water heater, under the washing machine, under the the sink. And it's a very simple installation. Mm -hmm. You know, some of these other monitors, you really had to have an A plus tech to install. This is the homeowner can install it, but now you're connected to the home, and now, you know, you have a deeper relationship. Why do you think that's a hot take? Do you think that a lot of HVAC companies are like, I don't think they need that, or why? Like, why do you think that's a hot take, basically? Well, I think most companies are kind of stuck in the mode that you know, well, we go out every six months, we send out our tune-up cards, or we have maintenance plans and, and such. But I know, you know, building scaled operations you hit a wall and the mm -hmm. wall goes, you can't, you get to a point of service agreements, you can't service them. Mm -hmm. And so you're making promises that you can't keep because you don't have the access to the technicians these days. So now you've transferred your model into a routine visit a couple times a year to, we'll come when the system is showing signs that it needs a little maintenance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, okay. which is, most all equipment, you know, big heavy equipment these days is looked at it that way. Okay, cool, perfect. What's a cold- That was a long answer. Yeah, right? it was good yeah. though, it was good. What's a cold trend in the industry that 
you believe people are maybe wasting their time, effort, or resources on, um, but a lot of people are still doing it, basically. Well, so this is a trend that I think that I never really agreed with, and and now with the scaled operations and PE and these more data-driven initiatives has really made it worse, which is highly dependency on web business, you know, mm. highly de dependence on web leads. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know it's important, and you have to have your finger on that. Uh, however, right now, think about it. HVAC shipments and, and water heater shipments are down 20% year over year. We pulled a lot of demand during the COVID years when people are sitting around their home and they had nothing to do, so they wanted to have modernization projects and get their house spruced up. They were spending a lot of time there. So we took demand that probably would be shelved for this year and the next couple of years, not to mention we have our interest rate issue, not to mention the economy seems a little squishy. And so all those factors, you know, and, and the fact that there's so many very large players, very more sophisticated players, the competition le sophistication level has gone 10x up, and we're all fighting for the same damn click, mm -hmm. right? And so this is the place where, you know, devoting all your time and energy to digital, you have to pivot a bit. One, you got to have a brand. You have to build a brand that's recognizable, that you have a story, an origin story that attracts people to your brand. Number two, guerrilla marketing still works. You got to get get the remember the old guerrilla marketing book. Oh, you yeah. might be too young, but oh, yeah. but like you know, guerrilla marketing still works. You know, you got to knock on doors. Uh, I, I answered a Facebook post yesterday on one of the HVAC sites where they were saying is is door to door dead. Door to door, door to door is the number one lead gen activity for remodeling contractors especially in the east, eastern mm -hmm. part of the country, it's still the, the tried and true, is door to door. Yeah, and w by the way, we're coming a little bit from roofing over to HVAC, and that's our biggest competitor. If I, if, you know, it's not Rhino, it's not um, any of these guys, it's door to door. And why? Because it works. It works. It works really, really well. No, I, I, you can you can run a door-to-door -door campaign with a sub fifty dollars lead cost. Yeah. And guess what? It doesn't get lost in the phone system, and it doesn't get lost with the CSRs. <laughs> yeah. It's right there, yeah. right? I think you know. At the end of the day, I haven't really dug into it much, but I believe that they probably stick. Mm. They probably stick better. Well, it's that hand-to-hand -hand combat thing. You, you're you're creating a uh, Salesforce as well, that is, the incentivization structures have to change, obviously, if you haven't done that before, but you're creating this sales force that is very excited to close that deal. <laughs> That's different, it. when they're when they're right in front of them and they created that opportunity, it's different. And what I said on this post, it, it, the, the, the um, lady was a plumber, or owned a plumbing company, and I said, there's not one house in America that doesn't have a plumbing problem going on right now. Not mm. one. I mean, water is corrosive, it's insidious, it's going to get out. Mm -hmm. And so everybody has something. So I think that would be the one of the pitches. I but, like it. Okay, so the next question I've got is, let's oh, say- let me, Wait, let me tell you another okay. story. I got yes, go. A couple years ago, I went to LA to look at a business, and it was a water heater replacement business, right? And I'm like, I've never heard of these guys, and I operate in LA, and I've been around in doing business in LA for 20 years. And so I never really heard of these guys, and so we get the story. These guys, over 20 years, had carefully just been mailing out those um, emergency shutoff stickers, okay? Mm. They, they took themselves self off Google Place pages. Hmm. They, don't know, they don't buy any, yeah. um, they buy no uh, clicks. You yeah. know? It's 100%. They mail out 800,000 of those cards every year. They, the, they run a $20 million business that makes $6 million a year. Hmm. <laughs> they sold the business for $200 million. Yeah. Not one 
pay-per-click dollar ever spent. Yeah. Nobody knew they existed. Mm -hmm. They just had a phone number on everyone's water heater. So there's a lot of other ways to get leads, and I think it's something where you really got to get more connected mm. than you can with the computer. Oh, I agree 100%. Okay, so... By the way, not to mention what Service Titan is rolling out too. Yeah. It's going to really challenge, you know, paper. paper talk, talk to me about that. What do you What do you see in there? I just think that's going to cut a lot of digital. I mean, what would you call that business? Is that what business you're in? Yeah, I I am, and but I'm cool with it because I like. I understand there's a lot of other ways to get leads, and I don't like people to be completely dependent on digital. I think like. If you are, it's a bad move. I think you yeah. should have at least five solid lead gen systems. And if you don't, you're at risk. Especially like generative search is coming, which is basically just Google's answer to ChatGPT, where it's gonna block up a lot of the space up top and essentially give answers quicker without people clicking through. So that's a danger right now in our industry. And if you were over-reliant on it, it could definitely hamper your lead flow. So generative search, if you're not checking that out and concerned about it, it's certainly not to add another thing to your list of things to be concerned about, but it's definitely something to be aware of because they're probably going to roll that out in the next three to six months, which is potentially 10 to 20% of our clicks will just be gone, which is, which is wild, but they had to do it to compete with ChatGPT. So yeah, interesting. Huh? Google is making moves. Um, Okay, so let's say somebody is winning with revenue. I'm sure this is a very common thing. Somebody is winning with revenue, but not necessarily with profit and cash flow. What are some things that you would suggest? What are some things that you would tweak? What do you say to those people when you're talking to them? Because I'm sure you've talked to a lot of these people. It's a very easy thing to do to get really excited about revenue and then profit and cash flow are struggling. Well, I've been a proponent for, you know, 20 years with all these best practice groups is that we should never run around and talk about our revenue, what size we are. Oh, I'm a $20 million company. I'm this. We should all just say what our profit is. Mm. That really levels everything out, right? Because in the end of the day, that's why we're here is to create a profit. You know, the, the, the role of the leaders in a business is to increase shareholder wealth, right? Mm -hmm. Not revenue. Uh, but look, the major fix, especially on an industry, is you got to be priced right. Number one, you need to understand the mathematics behind pricing so you can hit a good gross margin, mm. gross profit or gross margin. So, you know, you got to target above 50 in our kind of industry, certainly the mechanical trades. Um, and I see a lot of guys, they just don't understand the math. Mm -hmm. So you want a big fix? you got to make sure your pricing will yield you a minimum 50 or better gross margin on your business. Mm -hmm. So once you get to that point and you've got that under control, if you're not, you, depend, you take a look at your overhead and you may have to make adjustments to that too to mm -hmm. squeeze something out of the bottom, right? It, so it's, it's yeah. you, get, you sell something, you do the work, it's gross profit, you pay for some overhead, what's left over is your net profit, right? Mm -hmm. And then let me say this. I tell guys all the time, and you tell my own guys, gross profit problems can be solved in one day. What he does is he teaches the most valuable team in your business. He'll just add nothing but profit. There's so much money left in the call center. So much money. If you're not at a 90% booking rate, showing empathy on the phone, smiling on the phone, making sure they're having a better day after they got off the phone with you, then you need to call Power Selling Pros and see Brink. Gross profit problems can be solved in one day, which means you go there, you fix your pricing, you tell everybody, this is what you charge, this is what you say, solved. You know, when people say, well, I'm trending, and I'm working on my margin, blah, 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 I think that's just bullshit. <laughs> pricing, you know, pricing dictates the margin and controlling the cost that you uh, predicted that that job will, will cost you to do, those two elements will create the margin, right?
So make sure it's priced right, make sure you control every job, and you're going to automatically hit that number and make a profit. Okay, I'm going to give you a different perspective on this industry. I, I was talking to somebody whose husband works for an HVAC company that got bought by private equity. Mm -hmm. And she was saying he was tired. They had to raise their prices overnight. And he felt like it was exorbitant. And you know how sometimes it's a little bit of like, you got to get your confidence up about the value that we're providing. Um, how do you manage that at scale amongst technicians to not let them feel like, you know what I mean? To, how can we change their mind about this price? And we need to price this to have a profitable business. How do you manage that through an organization down to the technician? It's a lot of teaching and a lot of reinforcement on the value of the company and the value of them as technicians and the value that we bring as, as a company. And, uh, you know, it's, you can never stop talking about it. You can never stop. It just has to be in your vernacular every single day. You know, when I was younger and I had a little more, less patience, I would go buy a business and I would bring everybody together and I'd say, I'd bring a trash can into the meeting room, say everybody line up and throw their price books in this trash can. And they'd throw it in and then pick this new price book yeah. on your way out and sit down and let me explain to you what we're doing. And I'm like, this, this is not for negotiation. The business doesn't work. This is the fix. Mm -hmm. We need to survive. I was a little more, uh, <laughs> less, uh, what would you call it? It's a, it's less sensitive, yeah, right? Yeah. But now, you know, I've, um, I've, uh, aged a little bit and so now I understand we take a lot more time to do that but you know there's all kinds of techniques like you sit down and you pull out a hundred bucks and you go through a P&L and you show what everything costs and how much is really left over at the end of the day mm -hmm. but look how about this one let's say that the average net profit of one of these businesses even the big ones is 15 points right think about this when customers complain about your price, what I usually say is, I say, well, look, after tax, we make about 10, 10 cents on the dollar. So how much do you want to discount out? Because I only have 10 cents <laughs> that's profit. So if you take more than 10 cents, I, now I have to pay, I have to contribute to your home mm -hmm. when it's a price complaint. <clears throat> but uh, just think about that. There's The margins are very slim in terms of they're big in terms of business, but they're very slim in terms of revenue versus the percentage of net profit. And I mean, at the end of the day, it's also, you want to feel good about every single pricing situation and be out of business in five years and you can't service them. You can't do what you said you're going to do. So to me, it's a, you know, it is, a, it's important to stay alive as a business more than anything. Um, let me, okay. let me throw yeah. this one little yeah. tip at you though. I've seen companies and do a very good job where they, you've heard this new term call, like call manager, which we've been running that playbook since the early 2000s. But uh, if you guys, if you have guys that are just insecure about your pricing and they just don't feel good about it or they don't want to, a lot of guys don't want to have the pricing conversation no matter what you charge. If you were charging 75 bucks an hour. So what these guys have done is they turn the price book off in their software for those techs. Hmm. And the technicians will go around and he'll assess the situation. He'll call back the office. The guy at the office will have the iPad. He will build the ticket. Hmm. He will have the conversation with the, with the customer. And then, then the, the service job, it takes the pressure off the tech. Uh, it generally is a better conversation between a more skilled communicator and you know they wrap up the deal that way. That's pretty smart, yeah. I like that. Okay, so I noticed you guys, obviously you have the brand story, you with the flashlight with your dad. Uh -huh. um, you do branding very well. I know you worked with Kick Charge on a logo uh -huh. revamp uh, 10 years ago or yeah. so. Um, my question to you is, what are some of the most important elements of positioning marketing systems and a company story. I know there's a lot in there, but I'm saying, what do you think of like pretty critical for an HVAC company to have? 
you have to have a story. You have to have an origin story that is relatable. You know, I was so lucky, and the, the main reason why I bought Gettle was the brand. Another piece of it was, though, when I was 10 years old holding the flashlight for my dad, the first air conditioner I ever lit up with a flashlight was a Gettle, and my dad was a Gettle dealer in Las Vegas. They used to manufacture equipment. So, you know, Gettle's been in my life for a long time. Uh, but they, the brand story, the Gettle brothers invented the residential air conditioner. That's a hard one to beat, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they were, they have 114 patents for HVAC technology. Well, I bought yeah. it because of the brand that had a very powerful story. Everybody's got a story, um, but the holding the flashlight for your dad was taken, so you can't use that one. But everybody's got a great story. It's like the story has to tell who you are, why you're here, and what that means for the customer, right? Mm. Um, but I will say, having a brand story that's impactful, that people can relive in their life, mm -hmm. and uh, have, a, have a good feeling that they kind of know the guys, they know the company. Uh, it's like Gary Vee says, you know, the job of marketing is to sell the job before the salesman shows up. Exactly. That's exactly what has happened. We have such a relatable story, and people people call us routinely and say, I can't wait till our air conditioner breaks so we can call you. Mm. I just want to say I love your ad so much. So I think, you know, the ad needs to sell the job before you show. Mm. And you do that by creating a memorable brand that relates to a human being. I love that. I do have a bonus question on here if you're down for it. Sure. So what should a successful home service business owner be investing in besides the business? I heard that you're into real estate a bit. So I wanted to just hear a little bit about um, what else somebody can be investing in additionally alongside this business. Let's say it's kind of crazy to think, you know, we, we, we tr are trying to make a profitable business. By the way, are you open to this question? Sure. Okay. We're trying to make a profitable business and you start to get profit, right? Like you start to find a profit. Um, where do you put that money besides just investing back into the business? And yeah. Well, obviously real, real estate's an easy one because every, you know, luckily for us, you know, we have to use the most valuable today's, most valuable type of real estate, which is industrial warehouse space, right? That's the most value, that's the most coveted right now. So obviously you want to try to buy a building bigger than you need. Mm -hmm. One, because you're always going to grow out of it. It's been my experience. Number two is because if the business can cash flow that and afford it, you have a greater asset in the future. So I would say real estate, certainly just your own buildings or similar properties. Um, what I've been investing in a lot is some of the ancillary services to the industry. Uh, you know, some technology for the industry, things like that. So, so all this kind of new stuff coming out, I'll go to these trade shows and I'll talk to the key people and see if there's any opportunities there. Because I like that one because we can kind of influence the outcome. Mm. You know, we can be, help, help it succeed. We can be quasi spokespeople for our investment where you can't do it if you bought Apple, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I like even stocks. I like the industries that I'm serving. Yeah. To be like, those are the ones I'm going to buy. Yeah. I also well, know a little bit more about them. Yeah, and you feel kind of feel, feel like you can influence the outcome. Any stocks you like in HVAC? Well, I've, I've done real well with Lennox for a long time. Okay. Um, anything, any other ones? Just yeah. curious, just curious what else you're investing in. Anything else you enjoy making money with? Uh, right now, I like businesses, um, trade-related services or technology that, that kind of meld into home services, real estate, and then just the typical old stock bond portfolio. Sweet. Um, hey, thank you so much for being on today. That's everything I've got for you. I'm really rooting for that second resurgence of the mullet. Um, and they make... They make wigs and stuff I, <laughs> I guess maybe it's a good halloween one for you yeah, just yeah. come back as your early uh business entrepreneur self um you're obviously an inspiration to a lot of people out there so thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with me 
And yeah, uh, great questions, by the way. Thank you. Appreciate that very yeah. much. And thank you, everyone, for watching. This is the HVAC Hustle Podcast. Please uh, rate, review, comment, etc. And uh, I'll see you on the next episode. Bye.